you can't wait five years to get your data center up and running if you want to be at the forefront of the AI arms race. So I, th I think time to power is making the interconnect a suboptimal strategy unless there happens to be some unique situation with your particular site, which lets you have that interconnect more quickly than say two years. So, uh, and I forget who, I know you mentioned this early in the pod and there may have been, I don't know if it was an all in thing, but does this mean, so for example, Detroit as an example, right? Detroit, is that the perfect use case? Yeah. You finally have something good coming to your end, even though your lines lost you know, in the playoffs, which we talked about before we went live. And there you go. So does that mean that there's going to be a revitalization in places like Detroit, where they have all this manufacturing building capacity that has been vacant for a long time? that in theory would have those interconnects already installed, that these new companies can go in and basically transform these old car factories that haven't been used in decades or years and instead turn them into data centers because they have direct access to the grid already, one would think that they would have had from the factories being there. Is that a good way of thinking about this? I don't think it's, it's quite that straightforward because if you haven't used a factory in decades, then the interconnect agreement you have is most likely expired. It's not clear that you can just go to Flint and grab the old GM plant that was abandoned in the 90s and go and turn that into a data center. I will say some uh, jurisdictions are trying to actively win some of these new data centers a little bit more proactively than others. Ohio, for example, like there used to really not be any data centers in Ohio, and they are building out a ton right now. And AEP, who's the local utility in, in, in Ohio, they're doing a lot of innovative things to, to try to help bring new business to the state. So there still are some regulatory roadblocks. We're actually watching a couple of developments there pretty closely from a regulatory standpoint. There's a pretty important case going through their Public Utilities Commission right now that would essentially create a landmark new tariff, which not the tariff that's in the news these days, but think of it as like an electric rate which would allow for building of on-site generation for data centers or for other new customers. It would be a kind of big break from the way deals like this have been made in the past, but basically because this situation is so unprecedented, they came up with a pretty creative solution that I think works, but it still is, it still needs to be approved by the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. I think jurisdictions that want to be creative and welcoming to new business like that have opportunities to do so, but even those have like legal and regulatory challenges that are not easy to just overcome in six months. Matt, how much do you know about the public electricity market in Texas and how that is similar to or different from what they're trying to do in Ohio? Because there's a reason why the Stargate location is here in Texas out between Lubbock and Dallas. Yeah, so I'm pretty familiar. I actually managed wind farms in both Ohio and Texas, as far as that on the, probably more familiar on the electric generator side than on the demand side. But yeah, largely ERCOT, the, the Texas grid is heavily deregulated. The Ohio market's a lot more heavily regulated, like generators have monopolies. So you have to buy your electricity from, a, from the, that monopoly that serves you in Ohio. And that's not the case. There's a lot more choice in Texas. But um, did you have a, a, a more detailed well, question on? Yeah. So the yeah. question was, what is the environment in Texas? You say it's deregulated. What does that mean? And then what is Ohio going to, does that offer the same types of opportunities? Yeah. So I think it's going to be different. Texas being deregulated basically means that like you can you can set up your own like electricity sales company basically and sell power you can basically buy power off the market and sell it to an end customer in ohio and in most of the rest of the united states that's actually illegal you have to buy your electricity from a regulated utility and there's kind of pros and cons to that the idea of a monopoly just sounds bad but like some of these guys are actually shady operators where like you can not really understand what you're signing up for and take up like a fully variable rate and then all of a sudden get hit with some crazy charge because electricity prices spike to four thousand dollars a megawatt hour and you just didn't know because you're a consumer so there, there are some reasonable reasons to want some protections but the i think the way that they're deregulated and the what the, this model that ohio is considering are a little bit different and maybe we can just talk about the ohio proposal in a little bit of, of detail essentially it's illegal for the utility, so AEP, to own on-site generation. So uh, think of it like a gas turbine or, or whatever, that's actually on the customer site and then like charge that customer for that electricity. They are essentially proposing like a new, a new tariff that would allow 
a company like Microsoft or Amazon to essentially guarantee 85% of their total projected demand. So let's say they're building a hundred megawatt data center. Microsoft would say, all right, I guarantee that I'm going to take 85 megawatts for seven years. And that way, as you're paying to build out the infrastructure to support me, I'm basically making sure that if I decide not to build this, or if I bail after two years, the rest of the rate payers in Ohio aren't going to get stuck with all those grid upgrade charges. So it's a pretty novel approach that they're taking to, to basically have this minimum guarantee so that one of the main goals of the regulators is they want to make sure that whoever is causing the cost to be incurred is the one who's actually paying for those costs. And so this is a pretty novel way to try to assure that these hyperscalers that are like basically causing AEP to build out a ton of new grid infrastructure are actually guaranteeing to, to pay for at least 85% of it. So that's a bit of a novel approach. It's, it has faced some pushback because of how unique it is. And they're basically moving away from a lot of precedent and how rates like this are made. But a lot of the consumer advocates in the state are actually supporting it. Walmart actually supports it because it protects their rates. So I think it's likely to go through, but it's a case we're watching pretty closely because I think it could be some, something that gives you an indication of where policy might go in the future. Is there any indication at this point in time where AEP would be developing the electric generation capacity to serve those data centers? Did you say that would actually be that on site that they would co-locate those with the data centers themselves or? Yeah, so it, it could be. So they, they would have that this tariff would allow them to pursue it a couple different ways. One of the ways that they could do it would be on site generation that AEP would actually own. So this would help to avoid a lot of the infrastructure challenges of building out new transmission and distribution, which could take seven years. So if you want to avoid some of those issues and actually build on site, AEP will, will build, own, operate it, charge you this tariff. And then that's a way of kind of minimizing some of the cost to the rest of the grid. So yeah, they're actually following these two different regulatory filings at the same time. One is on shaky legal ground, I would say. The other much more likely to go through is on much firmer legal ground. I won't go into all the nitty gritty, nerdy, like energy <laughs> regulatory reasons why that's the case, but it's pretty interesting. And I think it's something that just makes sense on a like purely logical standpoint. And I think other utilities should be looking at this as a potential model. So that co-located site from AEP, so the one that's right next to the data center that they are going to build and they'll tariff the company. So that is that would that be also connected to the grid so that that let's say they overbuild capacity, then that that generator power can then supplement the rest of the region of, over the long term? Or would it just be specifically designed just for, let's say, Amazon? Yeah, so I think it would be specifically designed for Amazon, but I believe it would be connected to the grid. Generally, it's better for all parties involved if more assets are connected to the grid than not. So you might have some, it's possible you could have some situation where, let's say because of the transformer shortage, maybe you can't get it connected to the grid for two years or something like that. Or maybe there's an interconnect study that's going to take four years. So you can set it up on site with the goal of connecting to the grid eventually, but AEP can at least get you the power from this in the interim. So there's a couple of different ways it could logistically work out depending on the site specific situations. But to me, like having the, the utility actually own, operate these sites, get them up quickly and then work on all the regulatory, the interconnect stuff on the back end. I think that's just a win-win. Got it. But it is very much state driven. So that could work in Ohio, but in Texas, it could be a whole different thing. It could just yep. be, all right, Elon. Okay. Tesla, we're not just going to create our own power now. Fuck it. Yeah, we have like, all this land. Let's go. Like Memphis, yeah. I, like, I still don't really understand how they got that interconnect to be increased so quickly. That was just something particular with either the regulators there or Elon pulling some political power. I'm not sure, but one of the frustrating things about the energy sector is so much of this is location specific. It's hard to talk about like trends, especially on the regulatory stand front, because it's so location specific. Do you think there's going to be grounds for a federal framework, just like how autonomous vehicles, it looks like the Secretary of Transportation is starting to push for more f a federal framework for autonomous vehicles. Do you think one for energy and power generation would be helpful? Or do you think that's inv too invasive in state rights? Like, how do you view that? So I think it is helpful, but just as one example, so FERC had this landmark ruling, I think it was order 20, uh, so the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They had this ruling 2222, like five years ago, I think it was, 
basically creating a framework to in incentivize more build out of distributed energy resources, this kind of co-located power that we're talking about, for example. Okay, they had this order and that's great, but then they had to go through to all the different ISOs, the <laughs> integrated system operators, basically the grid operators to say, okay, FERC had this order, how are you going to go and implement that in your own jurisdiction that you're managing? And so then that was multiple years of them figuring out how they're going to do that. And I've lost track of what's happened since, because it's just like, there was this landmark order and I was like, so excited about it five years ago. And then I look at, okay, so did that actually do anything? I'm sure there, some energy wonk could tell me specific, like a few specific instances of how this federal framework I didn't know um, energy a couple existed. <laughs> oh, they do. I listen to some podcasts. I can, there are some nerds out there I'm, and I'm one of them, but there are some, some people who follow this stuff in a lot closer detail that are great to listen to actually. So it could, it can help, but so much of energy is regulated at the state level in, in multiple ways. Like it can be state environmental agencies, and then there's like the EPA, and then you've got like the grid operator, and then you've got the public utilities commission, and then you've got like local permitting that you need and like nimbyism that's preventing a lot of build out. So like you get regulated from everywhere. So even if you had the perfect federal framework, you're still going to have a lot of these other issues. And like, the, I think one of the biggest issues right now is the interconnect and that's these ISOs, which most people don't really understand how they are. They're like regional networks or in Texas's case, it's ERCOT, the grid operator there that just tend to move slow and have this way of doing things. And they're nonprofit organizations that like are doing the best they can and but like their main goal is to make sure the grid doesn't fail and their main goal is not to accelerate the advent of ai through a faster interconnect process so there is a forcing function right now for states or localities that have very low regulations that would enable the fastest on-ramp to doing a co-located power generation facility for these data centers. So it seems like that's like the best case scenario, like a Texas place, alluding to Hans's question. It seems like Texas is extremely well positioned for a lot of these companies to put their data centers here. Number one, because a regulatory landscape feels like the best or one of the best, let's say. But number two, you also have a lot of sun. There's a lot of yeah. sun down here well, as well. A massive amount of wind power too. And, yeah. and that was actually one of the problems with the, the Texas grid in general is like you had all this wind in the panhandle and you'd have like negative prices because the, there's not enough transmission capacity to get it to the city centers, to the urban centers. So yeah, I think Texas is actually in prime position. That's why you see Stargate being built there in Abilene. I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but yeah, the regulatory environment in Texas is much better than most other places. So how familiar are you with how that came about? Like, Texas always just been relatively deregulated or was there deregulation that happened specifically to deal with, I don't know whether it was the installation of these massive wind farms or is there a correlation between those things? Yeah, so I, I don't know all the history of why ERCOT is set up the way that it is, but I can just give you an example. So I was involved in development of a wind farm in Ohio, and then about a year later, we developed a much larger wind farm in Texas. And like the amount of environmental reviews we had to go through in Ohio was like crazy. And then we ended up having to curtail, meaning like basically just dump power for about, I want to say it was like 5 to 10% of our overall power generation. So that's 5 to 10% of your revenue just gone because of a endangered bat that might get hurt by the, by the blades when they're out at night. So depending on certain wind speeds, so like direct decrease in the project's revenue. And then on top of that, we had to hire this company we, uh, that was like three people walking the different turbines every single day for two years, I think it was collecting every single uh, bird carcass that fell, identifying it, freezing it in case the Ohio Department of Natural Resources wanted to come and see which birds have been killed. The whole reporting apparatus that went along with that, like obviously very expensive to like <laughs> to do all that. And then it went to Texas and it was just like, there's no regulations. I was like, oh, it's like none? They're like, yeah, you don't have to <laughs> it's like, you don't have to do any bird studies. You don't have to like change your operations and have that reduced revenue. And I'm not gonna advocate for one or the other because honestly there are pros and cons, but that's the difference. It's it just a, a, on one small example, it's just like the environmental side, is just, it just made it so much easier.